Okay, well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm here to welcome you to EdChat Interactive. We're aiming to make video uh, professional development much more engaging than a typical webinar. And because of that, we're using this platform called Shindig, which is a little bit different from other platforms that you've used and a lot more interactive. So what I'd like to do is rather than me go through all the different things that Shindig can do, I'm going to show a one minute or one and a half minute video about Shindig and then I'll come back up. So this Welcome is Shindig. Welcome to Shindig, the video chat event provider. Click on any participant's image to engage in a private video chat. Double click on another participant to add them to your existing conversation. Click the arrow to exit. You can also send an instant message, either to an individual or to your entire room. Want to interact with the host? Use the buttons on the lower right. Click raise hand to signal to the event administrator that you want to be brought on stage. Otherwise, submit a question to the host via text. If the system has not automatically detected your webcam and microphone, roll over your image and click Settings. Click your image to enable your working webcam. Choose a working microphone by selecting the option with volume indicators that flash green in response to your voice. We hope this was helpful. Enjoy the event. Okay, now there's one other thing that, that I'd like to bring up about, about Chindig, and that is that if you do roll over your image, there's a picture of a lock. Uh, somebody asked me last time, well, what if I don't want people to chat with me? If you click on the lock, then people won't be able to chat with you. Now, I will say that's, that's um, one of the things that we really like about Chindig is the, is the fact that it allows us to do breakout groups. Uh, but if you really don't want uh, people to... Um, to be able to uh, ch chat with you, then locking or or then you can unlock if you, if you want to is, is one way to accomplish that. Um, what I what I also want to do is I want to have you try one thing in order to practice the interactive features, and I'll I'll blow this up for a minute, and that is what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to click on someone's avatar and I'd like you to discuss two different questions. Introduce yourself, describe where you're from. And then, and I'd like you to talk to the other person about an interesting project you have done in your school. Now, if you'll notice, one of the people uh, whose icons you see is Kathleen Fritz, who's going to be t speaking this evening. So you get brownie points if you can uh, click on her icon and talk to her. So, uh, so what I'd like you to do is click on somebody's icon, interesting project you've done in your school. I'm going to come back up in about two minutes, and then I'm going to introduce Kathleen. Great. All right. Looks like everybody had a chance to click on at least one person's avatar and introduce yourselves. Um, that's great. We're going to be doing some more small group work uh, during the, the course of the, of the session. And then I, I want to bring up that in on October 26th, our next session is going to be in, in honor of Halloween. Uh, we, we, wanted, we wanted to do something fun, motivational, and that involves l learning. And so we're going to be talking about can we reform education, uh, what's been tried, and, and using teachers as professionals. But there's going to be a nice twist during the course of the evening. And I'm not going to reveal tonight what that's going to be. But if you go to edchatinteractive.org and sign up, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll find out on October 26th. And now I'd like to uh, just introduce the, the subject tonight, which is project mapping, which is a process by which you, you plan a project so that students learn, the projects get done, and this and teachers stay sane instead of trying to move in all these different directions as, as the students go off in, in their different directions. The person who's going to be leading us tonight is Kathleen Fritch, Fritz. Uh, she's a designer, project leader, an educator, and an entrepreneur because she founded a company called Create on Builder, which is a which is a really interesting project-based learning tool. So I'm going to stop the slides and I'll bring Kathleen up. So Kathleen, hi. Hey, how are you tonight? Great, great. So just, um, I just thought, it, by way of a little bit of introduction, you were in Atlanta this weekend and maybe you can just describe what you're doing in Atlanta because I thought it was pretty interesting. 
Yeah, um, I work a lot with uh, the maker uh, movement here in Atlanta and in Savannah. And we had our mini maker fair. Um, and I was there, we were doing um, a make EDU conference, which is the first one that maker fair has had for, um, we had 300 teachers uh, who came and were learning about different components of um, making and everything from robotics and Arduinos to actually how to do design thinking in the classroom. So we actually conducted this project. What you're going to be doing today is a little bit of what we did, um, what I did there at um, Maker Fair. Wow. Okay, so I'm going to bring myself down. I'll bring your slides up. And you know the drill. Just tell me when you want the slides to advance. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about project mapping. And um, how many people actually think that this would actually be, is considered a project mapping experience? Um, this is part of uh, what we call um, idea mapping. And with idea mapping, what you're doing is you're trying to get to kind of the root aims of the kinds of projects you want to do. And it's part of the project mapping experience um, that we use a lot when we're trying to determine themes, do research, or inspiration. And we'll, we'll come back a little bit to this one. Uh, next slide. So as a designer, uh, I remember when I was in design school, um, I was shown this diagram of the uh, design process. And it, and it really does look like this kind of uh, string mess of chaos. Um, and I think a lot of people probably feel that way when they're trying to attempt project-based learning for like the first couple of times. It's like, how do you kind of reel in sort of this you know, six-headed hydra in order to actually have a project that has meaning to it? Um, and as you go through the process, things get clearer and clearer um, until eventually you have some sort of product um, that a project would produce um, with the students. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So, um, so what helps with this is a thing called the design thinking process. And uh, SAP is a global company based out of Germany. They're a um, big manufacturing company. And design thinking is something that's used um, across all industries. Um, it's used in manufacturing. It's used in architecture. It's used in developing products you use every day. Everything from uh, how uh, a mobile app works on your cell phone to even the design of the experience you have um, going to a walk-up teller on the side of the street to go to an ATM. So. All those things are designed and usually are using a design process to address a specific problem. So next slide. So the two methods um, in design thinking that we're going to use today for project mapping um, is deconstruction and decomposition. So if you think of deconstruction, it's really just breaking down um, the pieces of a system. And decomposition is, it separates the whole into sort of the sum of its parts or its elements. So that way you're sort of seeing like, it's like having a recipe. You have, you know, the bread and the, you have the flour and the eggs and the, um, you know, the sugar and the milk, but yet there's a system and steps that you actually go through to be able to know how to actually make the cake. So the next slide. So, this is what project mapping looks like. And if you look to the, um, I guess it would be uh, the upper left-hand corner, um, you'll see sort of, the, again, uh, idea mapping. And what uh, the teacher is doing there is they're looking at different standards that they're actually um, mapping to figure out where there might be some connected themes to be able to develop a driving question or a line of inquiry. On the right-hand side, you see teachers are from Centennial Elementary School. And they are actually mapping out a, um, a market day project uh, that you actually see below. Um, and so what that process is like, it's a lot of negotiation of understanding like, these various different parts. One of the things that we use um, as a physical um, component is we, I use cash register to even buy any um, staples, sticky notes, um, paper and tape, as well as, um, as, well as using um, uh, sharpie markers and what's great about this is that you're able to take the tape and kind of make like a timeline map of your project 
and you're able to move around the parts depending on where do you think things fit. So there's a lot of negotiation that happens. So we're going to cover that um, next. Next slide. So here are some of the components of project mapping. So the one, th and we're going to have you talk a little bit about this in small groups in a second. So we have basically um, a number of project phases. They may seem somewhat familiar, and they may seem um, a little specific maybe to science process, or they might seem similar to doing an artistic process. So investigation, we are always sort of investigating on some level uh, the information that we um, are trying to gather. We have to have a basis for um, the things that we're doing, and it's based on knowledge and based on primary sources. Um, then there's inspiration about the content inspire us to have new ideas or um, or can inspire us to um, think big about something um, think of all the possibilities that could happen analysis is very important um, kind of almost as a reflective activity analysis helps us to look at what we've just done and be able to make certain decisions to be able to what we call in design to pivot to do something different and then experimentation really allows us to uh, try out things very quickly, allows us to fail, which is very important in the project learning experience, um, and try again. And we call that reiteration. So these project phases um, are not necessarily in this order. Uh, for, for the example we're using today, I've placed them in this order. Um, and then we also have different components. I want to go through the other ones before we go off um, into our small groups. So we have feedback loops, and those can be anything from reflection activities um, to a critique. It could be um, the kids are writing like their own self-assessment. It can be a feedback loop. Um, problem identification or problem ID. You know, what are the different points in times? So we actually look at identifying the problems. You know, that might happen multiple times in a project. We have certain events that happen, including like a spark or ignite event. It could be a field trip. It could be a guest speaker. Um, and showcases are a really big event that um, a lot of people use for project-based learning to show the process or show final products. In mini lessons, we're really looking at what's the content that the standards are driving and when do you actually need to be teaching certain things. And lastly, we have deliverables. And deliverables are a combination of understanding the kind of project you're going to do. So if it's a game project, the students will actually have, you know, a game board or they may do a scratch game, and that would be a deliverable. Um, in design, we call that an artifact. Um, it could be a narrative like um, a podcast or a website. So those would be considered deliverables. So Mitch, I think I want the group, uh, people to join up with one or two other people and talk a little bit about the kinds of project phases that they've used in their projects. Okay, good. So what Kathleen has, uh, has brought up, and I'll shrink this so that so that you can see the other people a little bit better. Is that she brought up that that uh, in the project that she's going to discuss, she's divided the project into four phases. The first phase is going to be investigation. The second phase is going to be inspiration. The third phase analysis, and then the fourth pay, phase is, is experimentation. And what she'd like you to do is click on another person to discuss. Are these the four phases that? you would break your projects into and in your projects maybe you'd want to differ um, so if you can click on another person's icon and uh, discuss well do these phases make sense for the two of you is that is, are these the ones that you would use what other ones might you include or uh, what's the what's the sequence that you'd like uh, to do to, what's what's the sequence that you'd like to use so I'm going to stop my broadcast if you have questions uh, you can put them into the IM window and so Kathleen can see them or uh, you can ask a question in which case I'll see it or you can click on uh, Kathleen's icon or avatar and you can ask her directly 
So I'm going to bring myself down, and I have um, 18 minutes after the hour, so I'll give you about uh, three or four minutes in order to do it. Um, we'll pick you up in a few minutes. Okay, let me bring Kathleen up here too. So let's screen up. Hey, Kathleen. So hey. thanks to talk to anybody. Um, well, uh, yeah, um, I got a chance to talk to Mary, who actually was here, I think, last time. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, she does a really great project. She's on IM, so she doesn't have a mic. Hers is broken. Um, oh. But okay. she has a great project she does with um, introducing students to the concept of the Agora. Um, and um, as she calls it, let me just look back on my thing here, um, like a community of wealth sort of looks at those kinds of things where students make objects and bring them in, um, go through ascension, which would be like experimentation with the Agora. Um, and then they mm -hmm. do kind of an analysis and reflection piece afterwards. Um, so kind of, a, and it goes over about a three-week period as they work through different phases of this project. So really cool, really interesting project for economics. Okay. okay. Uh, do you want me to just bring the slides back, or do you want to talk, bring somebody up? What would you like to do uh, next? Is anybody interested in? I know there's a couple of groups that got together as a big group. They saw. Does anybody want to come up and talk about what? Um, talk about what they? I know Doreen uh, had a big group there. Do you want to come up and talk or? So I'd like to what I'd like to ask you is underneath your avatar there's a there's a symbol called raise hands. If you'd like to come up and talk uh, about what your group talked about, uh, and we'd like we'd really love to encourage somebody to do that. So somebody brave, please click on the raise hand icon, so we can bring you up. Oh, somebody, please. Come on. Who else would like to share what uh, they talked about? Somebody. Okay, there goes somebody. Okay, I'll I'll come down and I'll bring uh, Talania up. One second. Okay. Great, thanks. Hey, Talani, how are you? Hi, I'm good. This is so cool. I really like this tool. Um, yeah, and I just, I'll be brave. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk too much, but Nicole is a special ed teacher and. Mm -hmm. Um, in her role, she hasn't been able to do um, projects yet, but she's interested. And then Doreen um, works with schools to do a bigger implementation project um, mm. where the whole school is involved. And then I'm a math teacher, and I do um, um, a BIE model of PBL that's similar to yours um, in iteration. I was just sharing with um, them. A current, uh, we stopped, but I was sharing a current project my Algebra 1 students are doing about oh, cell phone. Okay. And what, what kind of project phases do you sort of see similar to from the BIE model? Um, it's very similar. Uh, the spark happens first, though, typically to kind of gain their attention. And um, mm -hmm. then the investigation and the activity, that part is like a constant cycle. Mm -hmm. um, as they keep reiterating to make their product better and reflect, I mean, literally everything you were saying, teach the lesson or provide the content when they need it, um, not mm -hmm. before. Uh, and then a public audience that they have to justify yeah. their decision to. And it yeah. could be that it's yeah. in a written form, but it's outside of them. Mm -hmm. Or it could be a public, like literally they're explaining at an exhibition. Oh, cool. Um, have you guys ever been like a shock tank? I'm sorry. Have you guys ever done a shark tank uh, yeah, at all? I, I have. Uh, my school is just now starting to come around to doing it. Um, I've been doing it for 10 years, but it's yeah. popular kind of until now. Uh, but I had some students. It was funny. We um, They were redesigning a popcorn container of a local movie theater. And so oh. they basically presented like Shark Tank style to um, some judges on which okay. design they should pick. Wow, that's fun. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I know we're trying to keep on, so I appreciate you coming up and and being uh and and being the uh, guinea pig up on up on the board here. <laughs> so, okay. thanks. We'll get that up to full screen. Okay, so we're just going to go through a simulation um, of a project that we'll we're going to sort of use as a way to break things apart. Um, so this is something called the Reuse Studio. 
And you'll see the project phases, which are one is investigate, two is inspire, three is analyze, and four is experiment. And to tell you a little bit about this, um, the first one is a cycle of uh, plastic products. And so if we, the whole point of a, the reuse studio, and this is something I presented this past week at Maker Fair, is that um, reusing or what they call upcycling materials uh, such as like egg cartons and cardboard, uh, plastic bottles can be really instrumental in designing products or creating simulations, using them to sort of make, um, you know, make fake, make almost like, um, like iPads made out of, to be able to go and prototype things like, um, you know, web applications in. So it's really important to have the ability to gather materials, students be able to have easy access to inexpensive materials in the classroom. But the challenges are things like where do you store them and how do you design a classroom around making, um, which a lot of project-based learning is, is around making things. So the Reuse Studio actually helps um, teachers to be able to go and transform their classrooms into more of a studio environment that allows for more, um, allows for the use of both the storage and the creation of, um, of new products um, and new experiences. So the first thing is that, um, Across all grades, students experience um, issues around recycled materials. Everything from understanding sorting on the very lower end grades, um, understanding life cycles, which happens kind of in third through fifth grade, um, looking at things like um, the construction of, um, of new products, uh, what containers to be able to go and make sorting easier or information campaigns to communicate um, better recycling practices, um, as well as looking at pollution and issues of pollution around the world, all the way up into being in um, high school where you're dealing with the issues of, um, right now there's huge problems with the sorting machines that happen in recycling where um, they get clogged a lot and recycling has actually become not cost effective anymore. Um, and so how do we solve that bigger problem that could go all the way, so this project could run anywhere from first and second grade all the way through high school, depending on what your standards are. So the second thing is inspiration. And so mood boards are used a lot as inspiration. They help students to go and gather up um, the things that they're thinking about, um, what they might be able to do with these recycled products. Um, it might be looking at, um, how something was made before and how they can adapt it. And so a mood board can help to get there and let students sort of expand their mind. The third thing is a SWOT analysis. And some people may or may not be familiar with SWOT analysis is. But pretty much it, it, as it is, it's an acronym for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And so this analysis allows you to go back and look at the life cycle of products, look at your inspirations and be like, okay, what could be the different things we could do, one, with the materials that we have, and also maybe even analyze the classroom space for where are the strengths and weaknesses and opportunities that they might be able to transform that space into something that would become more of a studio. So it can be done in a couple ways. The last part is experimentation. And so I have right there, this is a mock-up that's done of a layout of a, an apartment. Uh, done with blue painter's tape on a concrete floor. This could be something where you could take, you know, clear out your classroom and actually tape off the areas and have students actually understand how to plan for a space that would become a maker space or a studio space in your classroom without having to spend expensive money uh, on new products. But the students can actually sort of take some ownership and how they want to lay their space out. Mockups can also be of the products that you know you may want the students to make uh, from the recycled materials or prototypes, as we like to call them. So that's kind of those are kind of the activities that we would do. The bigger overarching activities that we would do as part of this project. So next slide, Mitch. And so we come back to um, our um, illustration of the uh, tape of the, of the tape with here are different phases and I've got them the activities called out. And so the first thing we're going to look at is problem identification. So the first thing might be after we investigate is how to reuse materials might be the first thing we might 
investigate. Um, if people want to sort of think about um, or raise their hand about where would be other places where we could identify problems and what other phases might we identify problems. And if anybody wants to type in um, the I am, uh, they can, I can read your instant messaging if you want to do it into the my room. Anybody wants to put any other places where you think we could identify problems and type it into their, um, type it into the my room on the shindig instant messaging. And then I can read them out for everybody. So you take a couple minutes to do that. So anybody else know where we might want to identify a problem somewhere in this timeline? Anybody not sure what we're what I'm talking about? Anybody want to ask a question? Sorry, I just okay, no problem. So um, what I can do is I can, Mitch, if you want to go on to the next slide, I think I'll my oh, you know, um, a possible problem. Oh, hold on for a second. Let's go back to small screen. So a possible problem would be paper from school. So we might want to identify like where are we going to get paper from school. So that might happen. That could happen maybe in the experimentation phase. Um, it could happen in the analysis phase. Asking a question. Um, another, um, you know, I sort of put like an idea of where we could put like another. Just before we start experimenting, we could start. Um, we could start asking other questions like, well, what are we going to build? What can we use for this? Um, would be another place where we can do um, that. Uh, natural disasters handled by the city, um, Mary put up there. So that could be a question like, you know, what happens to all of the, what happens to all the materials or is there a way that we can maybe build something that helps to support people when there's been a natural disaster, like shelf, temporary shelters out of the materials that maybe are left over. So that's a really good, that could be a good question that we might have. Um, for a problem that we want to identify. Great, thank you. Okay, so the next one is events. And I talked a little bit about um, the showcase um, that usually comes at the end um, of a project. And so that's right over, that's over on the far, far right hand side. Um, what are some other things that we could, what other, I know um, Talani, she actually, um, let me make sure I have your name right. Um, Talani, she mentioned in her interview about how um, they do a spark or ignite event to kind of kick off a project. Um, what might be some kinds of events that you would want to kick off a project? You can just type that into the instant messaging thing as well, into the My Room. Does everybody know where that is? Um, if you go to where it says Shindig on the left hand side where the instant messaging thing is, if you go to my room, you click on that, it shows the conversation for the whole for the whole group. So where else could we what else would we want to do an event or what kind of events could we do for this project? Uh, Mitch was saying maybe a kickoff event. What kind of kickoff event? We've got students visit a room filled with wasted paper or the ruins of a tornado. So maybe they go in and see like what happened to all the materials, what's salvageable, what's not salvageable. Great. Um, who else has one? Anybody else have something they want to offer? A good kickoff event maybe? Maybe watching like a relevant video before they get started. So it's another good one. So maybe get an idea of maybe what's happening in other countries um, around recycled materials or how they deal with materials after disasters. It's going to be very cool. I like this whole desert theme. Uh, display artifacts or findings in places around the school. So that kick off where the students maybe do an installation as part of their, um, and they're informing um, they're informing, you know, other people, other kids in their school about 